Welcome to the week one go-to session. This is the first of four such sessions we'll be hosting this month. Uh, welcome to English 101. Actually, it's called 1101 here at Full Sail. Uh, we have a pretty good turnout, about 10 people. Uh, yes, that is a good turnout for these lectures. As I was just explaining to the group of people who are here, these sessions are recorded uh, because not everybody can attend at Wednesday at 7 p.m. So for those of you who are here live, great. But for those of you who are watching the recording, that's fine too, okay? Um, I should explain real quickly that the lectures are always going to be placed in, you can see this activity here, week one lecture, archive, and required reading. So it's kind of a dual activity, right? This is the place where the lecture video will be housed, okay? And it'll be right there in the activity itself. So you can just click on it and start watching. But this is also where you need to go to find the required reading. And actually, let's stick there for a moment. Actually, let me go into the activity and show what it looks like on your end. Because uh, we're, we're kind of doing something different this month. The course has kind of been restructured quite a bit. So part of what we're doing new this month is we're using a new textbook called Writing Matters. We're going to take a look at that in just a moment. Uh, but yeah, okay, so here at Week 1 Lecture Archive, so the recording of the session is going to be found here. Those of you who are in attendance, you probably won't need to rewatch the lecture, but if you do, this, this is where you can find it. You can skip around to whatever you need to rewatch. Uh, but this is also where you'll see what you have to read, okay, for the week. Um, yeah, we're using McGraw-Hill Connect. And actually, let me jump over there real quickly because I'm already signed in. So... Um, if you, how many of you are signed up for the textbook of those that are here? Okay, Jill, good, good. Most people are. Okay, great. Uh, but in case there are people who are watching this lecture and are still unsure, it really is simple. I know the instructions are kind of long and there are videos, but it really is as simple as finding the PDF which is called Registration Details. I believe I have it saved on my desktop somewhere. Uh, where is it hiding? <laughs> oh, there it is. Okay, so you have this PDF under the registration activity and it's as simple as going down and clicking on this link. Don't copy and paste it because I've heard that that can cause problems. Just click directly on it. I'm not going to click on it because it's not going to take me to the screen because I'm already logged in, but it will take you to a setup screen. Okay, you'll see my name, you'll see the month, and you essentially just have to follow the instructions. Uh, you will need the textbook code that was sent to you via uh, your full sale email account or whatever email address you use to sign up for uh, McGraw-Hill. It should have been full sale. Um, if for some reason you did not get that textbook code, you need to contact FSO support. And actually, let me real quickly open up a blank document. Uh, FSO support. Oops. And the number is 877-437-6349. Yep, I have it memorized because I give it out so often and because I call it from time to time. Um, this is where you should turn to for not just textbook issues, FSO support is, they're the ones who handle textbook codes, okay? Uh, don't email them. I think they have a Twitter account. Don't tweet them. The quickest way to get a response is to call them directly, okay? And they're very very—they're very quick. Uh, textbook issues are the most, perhaps, common issues that they deal with. And I know most of the people here are not in this situation. But again, people who watch this recording, they might be having textbook questions. This is the number you have to call. Okay, and they'll get you a code, I think, usually within 24 hours. Uh, let's see. Uh, Deborah says, oh, yeah, you already paid. Oh, you're responding to someone else. Misty says, I did not get it. So I contacted FSO and I'm waiting for them to call me back. Okay, good. And if they don't call you back, bother them. Okay, I usually get in and I call this number, same number as you guys, and usually get through. Okay, so be proactive because they're, they'll, they'll, jump on it immediately but yeah if, if sometimes you wait for them to call you or if you tweet them or email them misty says believe me i will okay good and i wasn't suggesting otherwise i'm just again giving out the general information to everyone to yeah make sure that you get through and speak to a live person uh skylar says i'm having trouble with turn it in okay we'll talk about turn it in as well warren says i need a code because it's charging me 35 dollars. yeah you shouldn't be charging you shouldn't be paying anything 
I know that there's a way to sign up for a trial account, but the trial account only ha only lasts a week or two. Um, and I listen. Let me go back to the textbook. Okay, actually, let me close this entirely because we don't need that number anymore. Uh, where were we? Okay, McGraw Hill. What was I going to say? Oh, yeah, yeah. Warren saying uh, it's charging me $35. You can sign up for a trial account, but that only lasts, it won't last all four weeks. But I do have things set up. So let's go into the class, okay? And by the way, you have everything laid out for you. Like here's the week one reading, okay? So this is the reading you have to do. Week two, week three, and so on. And yeah, you can see it's 32 pages, but they're 32 fast pages. Don't worry too much. Um, and then there are also these achieve modules that you have to do for the first three weeks. And we're going to go in and look at this stuff, okay? So don't don't worry. We're going to do a little bit of a walkthrough. Um, yeah, you can see that the dates are set up. I need to repair some of these, actually. Actually, let me do these right now. And actually what I'm going to do is, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to set these to end at the end of the month. Why? Because if you want to work ahead on the achieve modules, I'll let you do so. That way, if anybody has a trial account, you could solve the issue just by getting all those achieve modules done the first three weeks. Of course, yeah, it would be pretty tough to get through 100 pages of reading within the first two weeks, but you could, I guess, in theory, do it. Uh, so here, the start date is fine. The due date is what I want to change. So let's make it, oh, let's just make it the end of March, even though we end before that. Oh, start. Mm. What date did we start? Monday? No, it wants this date. Okay, so let's start today. <laughs> okay, let's start today at, what time is that? How about 7.15 p.m.? So that way, in two minutes, it should register. Oh, uh, so <laughs> about 7.30 p.m. Uh, oh, I didn't put a zero before. Okay, so in about 15 minutes, this will be... You know what? I'm gonna, what what's wrong with this? Oh, I, I can't move it. Okay, well, well, screw that. Okay, so we do have to stick those dates. Um, here's the thing, though. Uh, McGraw-Hill allows you to keep working on things beyond the due date. I've actually created a little bit of confusion, and I apologize for that. I have all due dates set to end on Sunday. So uh, hopefully this makes sense, because I know this is super confusing. But even though it says, for example, due March 2nd, which is what, Friday? Yeah, don't worry. It's if you need to work on it Saturday or Sunday, that's fine. Again, you can go into the achieve module. You can even go into the achieve module a week after the fact and complete these things. Uh, don't do it a week late because there's a penalty for doing it late. But um, yeah, I can't change the due dates, so don't get confused. Okay, trust the dates on FSO. Let me put it that way. So. Here, I'm going to go back into this activity in just a second, but let me X out of it. Uh, yeah, you can see March 4th, right? Trust these dates, March 11th, okay? Sunday. Does that make sense for everyone? Just get Sunday in your mind as a due date for things? Yes. And, and okay, you should be good. Okay. The other thing I wanted to show through McGraw-Hill is... Okay, so you have these readings, right? And it's as simple as going, actually, let me show the student view. So you, I'm showing what you see on your end. Okay, so again, you have things organized. This is how things look on your end. So you go into week one and you do the readings. Okay, so you just have to click, click begin. I have a brand new laptop. <laughs> I don't know how to turn off the pop-up locker. Uh, uh, oops, your pop-up locker is preventing. Oh, please turn off your pop-up locker. Uh, maybe if I do a search, pop-up. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, I'll figure it out later. Oh, this, this stinks. Because I was going to walk you through the actual Achieve modules. Uh, but basically, click, okay? And it's going to walk you through. Like, as soon as you click, the readings are just readings, okay? So you have to do them. Trust me, when you click on this guy and you have your pop-up blocker turned off, again, this is a brand new uh, Terry saying for your computer. It might be in the upper right corner bars. Yeah, but you know what? I'm not going to fool around with that now because that's not very interesting for people to watch. <laughs> Uh, I'll figure it out later. It's a brand new laptop, okay? Brand new MacBook. Uh, but yeah, you click on it and the reading will pop up. Same thing with the Achieve modules. Now, the readings are just readings. These Achieve modules, one do each week, okay? Um, these are interactive. So when you click on it, it will even ask you if you want to set up a schedule. You don't have to follow that schedule. It might ask you to do an hour, three days a week, or maybe two hours, two days a week. Uh, you could sit down and do it in a single sitting if you want, but it will set up a schedule if you would like that. Um, basically, they're, again, interactive modules, mostly grammar-based. Okay, so this is kind of our tool to help you improve in those areas. And you just need to complete them to 100% and you get 100 if you complete it to 78%, you get a 78. There's no reason why people shouldn't be getting perfect 100s, okay? Um, and you can always check your progress, I believe, by going to the left. And I actually need to be in the reading, so I won't be able to show it. But when you're in the readings, you'll have a table of contents option here, and that will show you your completion percentage. Once I get my pop-up blocker, <laughs> blocker disabled, <laughs> My plan is to make a walkthrough video. I had a walkthrough video that I've used in past months, but because we're doing things a little bit differently this month, I need to revise it because half the things in the walkthrough video are no longer relevant. Uh, we were do using a completely different book for the readings. Um, my final thing about the readings, um, you have these assignments here, okay? Week one journal response, week two journal response, and you can see they're worth 5% of your grade. Uh, let me go into that real quickly. So if we look at the basic in instructions, okay, you can th read through most of this on your own, but you read the assigned chapters from the textbook, you watch the lecture, which you're doing right now, those of you who are in attendance, and after you've finished with the reading and the lecture, this is another reason why I moved it to Sunday. I think it's a little bit rushed to do all this by Friday, especially since I'm a ho holding the lectures on Wednesday nights. That's not giving much of a turnaround time. Um, yeah, once you've finished the reading and watched the lecture, write a brief response that addresses the following. Using quotes and or concepts from the reading as well as the lecture, explain your understanding, okay, of blah, blah, blah. Let me boil this down real simply. In essence, this is kind of like a quiz or a checkup to make sure that people are doing the reading and watching the lectures. Because here's the thing, people watch the lectures, they do just fine in this class. Okay, and most people earn A's and B's. Okay, I, I give those grades out like playing cards, because yes, if you're watching the lectures, you'll you, you probably won't stumble too often. When people don't watch the lectures, then problems happen because the assignments in this class, you you can't really guess at what you're supposed to do. Um, so if you're not watching the lectures or attending them and trying to complete the activities, chances are they're not going to be meeting the requirements of the assignment. Um, so yeah, this is just us kind of being proactive. On the one hand, you're going to learn from the readings and hopefully the lectures as well. Uh, but to make sure that you're doing it, we're asking you to write a short response. Now, what do I mean by a brief response? I'm thinking a short paragraph maybe that summarizes the reading and maybe a short paragraph that summarizes the lecture. Uh, that would work. And you have here an explanation of uh, grading. Okay. Uh, here's the thing. Essentially, show me that you've done the reading and you've watched the lecture. If you do that, uh, you should do fine. Okay. I will say be, pay attention to things like proofreading and grammar and mechanics because there's an explanation of this here. Um, because sometimes the temptation is, especially when we're writing online, is that people get a little bit loose because so much of our writing, whether it's a Facebook update, obviously a tweet, a text, uh, but even like an online discussion thread, yeah, people don't worry so much about the rules of grammar or uh, putting an apostrophe in a contraction or capitalizing the word, the pronoun I, okay? So be careful because there are point deductions for not doing those things. 
Uh, Misty says she's not hearing a thing. So let me type a quick response to Misty. Misty, you might try leaving the room and entering again. Or um, click on the audio tab in your control panel and make sure the levels are moving. Okay, but I think everybody else is hearing me, right? Okay, so does everybody get the gist of the journal response? And you're going to type your response right here. Okay, again, just make sure that every piece of writing you should be doing for this class. So that means not only the major assignments, but these journal activities, even a message to the instructor. Here at Full Sail, your writing should be aiming always for the highest level of professionalism. Okay. So that means, yeah, proofreading. It doesn't mean that I'm going to be looking over your response and deducting points for every nitpicky issue. No, but I don't want to see something that's all lowercase or doesn't use punctuation or clearly has been written so quickly um, that it looks like it. Okay. Um, let's move forward with what we're doing for the month. Okay. Uh, Jill says, so you just need to read the pages of McGraw-Hill. It doesn't need marked as complete or something to that effect. No, because you're going to be proving that you've read the material in your journal response. Okay. So, I mean, I mean, my advice, again, is if you write, let's say, a short paragraph that covers the reading and a short paragraph that covers the lecture, that you do, the, do so with enough specificity that I get a sense that, yeah, that person has done the reading. Okay. Um, will I be able to tell if you've read every sentence of every chapter? No, probably not. But you should give me an indication that you didn't just read the first chapter and the last one. <laughs> okay, make sure you pick one in the middle too <laughs> if you're going to skip. <laughs> I shouldn't be giving tips to cheat. Uh, yeah, do the read. It's, it's shorter than you think. Okay, but let's talk about this month's class. Okay, and what we're working on because this is the bulk of the session and this is what you'll probably be. Uh, writing about in your journaling response. This has all been kind of bureaucratic stuff about the handling of the class. Christina says, if we were to write the prompt in a Word document, do you want it in APA? No, no, no. Um, and yeah, I mean, listen, if you want to attach a Word document, that's fine, but you can use the space here, okay? But no, you don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. APA, we're not going to get into until a little bit next week, but even more so for week three, because week three is when you'll do an essay draft. And let's start talking about what we're doing this month, okay? Oops, let me start on the first slide. So welcome to week one. Okay, so we're going to start talking about what we're doing for the month, because we are working towards a single essay but we're going to do so step by step. Oh, I should also notice that you do have these materials here, like the syllabus, the course resources, office hours. Um, I, my office hours should be listed under the welcome activity. There's a little bit about me, a brief bio, and it includes my office hours. Although I have to fix them because they're actually a little bit different this month. I'm in the middle of a move, um, so, which is affecting things. Um, but the rest of this information can be found under the about tab, okay? George says, can you share the code for McGraw-Hill on here, please? Uh, I can show you where it is. Oh, yeah, someone asked about turn it in. <laughs> okay, let me ad address those real quickly. Okay, so first McGraw-Hill. Okay, so you go into the McGraw-Hill. It's all under this getting started. Okay, so McGraw-Hill registration. And again, just skip all these instructions. Don't know why the department has so many instructions and so many videos. All you have to do is open this, click on this, and then follow the steps. And there is no code, George, for the McGraw-Hill. I mean, there is a textbook code, but that should have been sent to your email address. And if you didn't receive one, you need to call FSO support at 877-437-6349. Okay, so there it is in the chat. Okay. And as Emily said, if you're talking about login information, it should be your email address. But if you're talking about the textbook code, now someone asked about turn it in earlier. So let me address that real quickly too. Okay. So turn it in, uh, same deal. You go into the registration. And again, you can skip through most of this. 
the important information is here. Okay, you need this class ID, that long number, and then the enrollment, the password, madness, and make sure it's lowercase, okay? I should have put that in there, lowercase. Why did I pick such a weird madness? Because it's March, right? March Madness. I know not everybody is a basketball fan. I'm not a basketball fan. And we might have international students who have no idea what college basketball is or what March Madness is, but that was the connection, okay? Like last month's keyword was Valentine because February is Valentine's Day. So uh, you need this class ID, this password, and you should be able to set up your turnitin.com account, okay? Easy as pie. So let's talk about this month. So these materials, most of them can be found under the About tab. My office hours are located under the Welcome activity, where you can learn a little bit about me and see my office hours. Why do you have to take this class? Uh, you can read through the information on the slide while I'm speaking. Um, <clears throat> in general, and I think students know this, even the ones who say, well, I don't need English. I'm a game art student or I'm a recording art student. Um, I don't think students believe that. I think students understand the importance of being able to write well and speak well. I think students understand that when you look at most successful people, whether it's someone in the music industry, whether it's a graphic designer, whether it's a mobile app designer, a cinematographer, all the different fields of study we have here at Full Sail, um, successful people, yeah, they, they tend to be bright and they tend to be pretty well-spoken and they tend to be strong, strong in communication skills, again, both in writing and in speaking. As I always say, find me a dummy who is incredibly successful and doesn't have these communication skills. Uh, so yeah, I think you know the importance of being able to write well. Um, and in this class, we'll try to take a look at your writing and through the assistance of the readings, as well as those interactive modules you have to complete, um, will hopefully improve things a little bit. We only have four weeks. I know that's a lot faster than a 16-week semester, but um, yeah, we're going to make some strides this month. Okay, so as I said, we're working on one essay this month. That's it, one essay, not four separate papers. I mean, there are different activities that require, uh, that have different requirements, and they are, they're going to require effort from you, but we are working toward a single essay. And what will that essay be about? Advertising. That's why I have this image here of a cityscape, which is filled with advertisements. Um, the advertisements we're looking at, though, will either be television ads or print ads. Um, sadly, you can't just choose whatever ad you want for your ad analysis paper. You have to choose from the approved list. So I, I apologize. Let me get away from this for, for a second again. You can find this list under this activity here. Okay, assignment overview, the essay. If you go in here and scroll down, here you have a list of, uh, what, eight ads. The first five are television commercials. The final three are print ads, as indicated here. I'll give one piece of strong advice right now. Look at all of them. But choose an ad based on things you can see clearly. And we're going to use some examples, okay? We're going to look at some ads in just a moment. So we'll get some practice at brainstorming. Some of your reading this week has to deal with brainstorming. Uh, so the brainstorming on this end is going to be more about taking a look at your ad and learning to spot important details, okay? Meaningful details, because that's what ad analysis is about. Um, just as you might lift the hood on your car to examine the machinery that's underneath, we're asking you to do the same thing with an ad. Okay, so if you choose the McDonald's ad, the Allstate ad, uh, the World Wildlife Fund ad, yes, we're asking you to take a close look at it and to notice important and meaningful details. And again, we're going to get some practice at this in just a second. Uh, but after the lecture, one of the first things you should do is, yes, look at all the ads. And even if you love McDonald's, or you love to play Call of Duty, don't pick those ads if you can't notice things in it, okay? And again, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself because we're going to look at examples of ads and talk as a class about what sorts of things stand out to us. But after the lecture, yes, choose an ad based on things that you can immediately think, oh, 
yes, I can see things in this ad. I can notice things. Because what sometimes happens is a student chooses an ad, but then doesn't feel comfortable discussing it. And then I have to politely, but also strongly say, well, maybe you should have picked an ad based less on your love of McDonald's and Big Macs and more based on, oh, I can see things in these ads. By the way, I didn't choose these ads because they're personal favorites, because I love them. That's not required. Uh, you should be able to pick any ad and be able to analyze it. But yes, you have to choose one of these eight approved ads. I've specifically chosen ads that I think have things that stand out pretty easily. Although I always, the Chico one's kind of difficult. I People are, are free to choose it, but I, I always mean to get rid of this one because it's, it's probably the most challenging of the bunch. But um, the rest, yeah, they're, they're chosen because I think they have six, seven, maybe more things going on that can stand out. <clears throat> Jill says, the last two links send me to the front page. You mean these links? Are they no longer working? Uh, let's see. Okay. Thank you, Jill. I think I, I'll need to update that. I'll need to fix that. Yeah, that's the problem with these things is that sometimes the links no longer work. So I need to fix that pretty immediately. Misty says she got it fixed. Okay, good. But I need to fix it for everyone. Um, I'll do that after the lecture. And I got out of the <laughs> area I went to be in. Okay. And what about the other one you said wasn't working, Chico? Okay, same thing. Uh, yeah, I can find them real quickly. Okay, and I'll, I'll put in a working link. So, <clears throat> um, okay, so let's do some practice. Do, 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 do. Hold on. Uh, okay, we've already talked about this. Okay, ad analysis. This is what we're focusing on this month. Do I expect you, are you ever going to have to write ad analysis in your life? Eh, probably not, but that's not the importance here. The importance is twofold. One, it's through ad analysis that we're going to learn the basics of essay writing. So we're kind of aiming for a traditional thesis driven. We're going to talk about thesis statements a little bit later. Five paragraph essay. Okay. And we'll talk more about what that is next week, though many of you probably already know what that is. Um, so yeah, a pretty standard traditional essay and ad analysis is kind of the means through which we're going to write that kind of classic standard essay. Uh, the other reason is because, yes, I want you to become a bit more comfortable examining things, thinking about things. You're all in industries where you'll be required to do this. If you're a music producer, obviously you're going to have to do thinking and make judgments and analyze things. Same thing if you're in graphic design, mobile app design, etc. Okay, we don't blindly go through the go through life without examining things. Okay, even people who are sometimes resistant to analysis. They you do it all the time. You do it with friends. You do it with uh, friends in the relationships that they're in. You do it with sports guys. Not only guys, but guys especially. Yeah, they love to talk about sports and analyze it to death. So the same thing, except here we're asking you to use that brain power and channel it towards the analysis of an ad. Okay? But you do analysis all the time. Um, and yes, we're going to be looking at how do advertisers persuade an audience. Um, or think about it like this. Ad creators, ad designers get paid a lot of money to create these ads. Okay, Many of these are million dollar ad campaigns. So no detail on an ad is accidental. So this is what I'm ultimately asking you to do to and think of the number three, because I'm going to repeat this a lot throughout the month. You have to identify three interesting, meaningful details in the ad or think about it in terms of moves. OK, you need to be able to spot three moves that the ad makes or three choices that the ads creators have made. OK. Um, well, that looks kind of goofy. Okay, but that's supposed to say the creative process. And this month is designed so that we're going through each stage of the writing the writing process week by week. As you can see, the writing process looks like a pentagon. Um, and yeah, week one, we're here brainstorming. Okay, so you're going to just choose an ad and you're going to look at it and hopefully identify some of those important or meaningful details and start drafting a thesis statement, a working thesis statement. 
Uh, week two, we're going to be kind of here researching. There is research required for this paper um, and organizing your material. Uh, by the way, the first assignment is a worksheet. It's a brainstorming worksheet. So you'll choose an ad, watch it with care, and then complete the worksheet. Um, if your worksheet is in good shape, including your thesis statement, yes, you can take the, the next step and organize your material. And this is why that number three is so important, because as we'll look at later in the keynote lecture here, uh, the thesis is going to name your three things that you've spotted in the ad. So if you choose, let's say, the Call of Duty ad, and you want to discuss the ad's diverse cast, its choice of music, and its camera work, those three things are going to be listed in your thesis, and those are going to become the three main points of your paper. Okay, They're each going to get a paragraph. This is where the five paragraph structure comes in. Okay. Um, anyway, that's a matter of organizing. In week three, you're going to write a draft of the paper. In week four, you're going to get feedback from not just me, but from two of your classmates through peer review, and you're going to revise that paper. Okay, for the last day of class. Deborah says, "Is there a worksheet to download?" Yes. It is uh, here. Okay. The final activity for each week is at the very bottom. And it's also worth at least 10%. So if we go in and scroll down, here's the worksheet. Okay, and actually I'll go ahead and open it up. Uh, we'll look at it in a second. You always have examples. They're a little bit hidden, okay? Uh, because we don't want people to download the file directly because then the temptation would be to replace maybe some of the wording in that document with your own and we want you to compose your entire responses on your own, okay? Uh, not just recycling somebody else's work. Um, it's contained here in a heading. So it says, step one, preparing to write worksheet example. So if you click on the heading, you can see someone's previous worksheet. And this is for a Diet Coke ad, which we're going to watch in just a second. Or actually, probably a few seconds, because we're going to look at some other ads first. Okay, so you can see a previous example. Okay, including her thesis statements. We want you to create two thesis statements, because maybe one is a little bit better than the other. So we want you to take two stabs at it. But yeah, there's the worksheet. But first, let's, let's, let's put some of this into action by looking at some examples. There's just a repeat of what I said. Each week is devoted to a separate stage in the writing process. Okay, so here's an ad from Jeep. Uh, I don't know if you could see it that well, but it says Jeep, and it says see whatever you want to see. Okay, that's what the wording says. And you can see it's right side up here, upside down below. And by the way, you don't see two images like this side by side. I'm just showing it this way so you can see the visual trick, right? Normally you just see what's on the left here. And then the upside down writing encourages you to look at it upside down. And as you can see, looked at one way, it looks like a giraffe's head. Looked at another way, it's a penguin. And yes, as Misty said, it's a neat kind of visual trick, right? So even though you might not feel comfortable at all, I'm going to ask a tough question. Uh, what are some things that stand out to you in this ad? And actually, I have a slide out of order. Let's see, is it the next slide? Yeah, think, of this, think in terms of this. In very general terms, what you're looking for in terms of three moves that the ad makes or three choices that the ad's creators have made can roughly be divided into two large groups. You could examine formal qualities. So these are issues of the ad's use of color, sound, music choice, camera work, etc. In other words, technical stuff, okay? Formal is another word for technical. Or non-formal stuff, as I call it, thematic qualities. These are issues of theme, motif, character, story, audience, etc. Okay, so kind of like, yes, non-technical stuff. Okay, uh, people-driven things. Uh, so if I go back to the Jeep ad, oops, uh, there we go. Uh, what are some things that stand out a lot? Emily said Jeep rolls a lot. I'm not sure what that means. But let's think about what I just went over. Formal qualities, so technical stuff. Uh, 
Emily says, or excuse me, Misty says, the animals that were used. Okay, but what about the animals? Or actually, that's a good thing. Okay, why does he use animal imagery? Why isn't it some other reversible image? Why doesn't it take the image of, I don't know, the, the, the car itself? Looked at one way, it looks like a Jeep. Looked at another way, it looks like, I don't know, a toaster. <laughs> why is it using animals? Okay, Emily, good. Because don't get so focused on the car, okay? Because there's no car in this ad. Yes, it's for a vehicle. Uh, but Emily, when you say the linen texture, right? That kind of textile quality. Uh, see, Misty's or someone else said something interesting. Jonathan, the art style and background is kind of rugged. Okay. Uh, Timothy says, when you think of Jeep, you think of the outdoors. Yes. Okay, good. I'm getting lots of good ideas. So let's let's stay with one because I think it was both Jonathan and Emily who focused on the background. Yeah, it's got this textile fabricy kind of quality. Uh, why do that? Or what is this background both in terms of its texture and its color? Okay, it's kind of beige or mauve or khaki colored. Why that color? And why that kind of textile like background? What does it remind you of? Okay, good. Great. Emily says safari. Warren says dirt. Right. And why would that? I think you're already making the connection. Why would that be important for Jeep? Because as someone noted earlier, exactly, Warren. We think of Jeep as an off-roading vehicle. Yes, good, Misty. And Deborah, the desert, right? We think of safari. Even though most people use Jeeps to... How should I say? I think a lot of Jeep owners, probably their tasks are a little bit more suburban than <laughs> sub-Saharan. But yes, the kind of romanticized notion of Jeep is that it's the vehicle you use to go off the beaten path. If you're going to go on safari, it's not going to be in a Lexus or a Cadillac. It's going to be in a Jeep, right? We often associate the Jeep with either the military or, yes, the outdoors in general. So the color choice and the quality of background makes sense. Okay. By the way, that's what analysis is. Because here's the thing, you might look at this ad, and yes, on a subconscious level, you understand that the background is chosen for that very reason. But you might not consciously think about it. So it's your task to notice these sorts of details. And by the way, I think this ad, this kind of answers the other detail that was raised, right? The imagery itself. Why the animal imagery? Again, because it's in a Jeep that you could possibly travel to uh, the savanna or, right, uh, the, the uh, I'm, I'm, I'm stumbling over the word. I have it in my actual essay. Um, by the way, I've written, I don't have a worksheet completed, but I do have an outline for week two and an essay for week three. I decided to do the activities that students do, so I wrote a paper. So even though I made up a name, Jane Student, that's actually me. And this is a this is my ad analysis for the Jeep ad. And you will have access to the outline for this paper next week because you'll have to do an outline for week two. Don't worry about that yet, though. We're not there yet. This week it's a brainstorming worksheet only. But yes, next week you'll do an outline, and then the week after that to write an actual draft. And you'll have access to those in those coming weeks. But as you can see here, I've written a full essay. Um, and yeah, in my introduction, I riff on that very idea. Okay, I'm not going to read the entire thing here, but Jeep, the well-known brand, practically markets itself with its reputation for ruggedness, independence, and adventure. Someone here already mentioned the word rugged. I use a quotation, but then I, yeah, I riff on the entire the Serengeti. That's the word I was looking for. Uh, but all this, okay. You know, the Jeep spirit and the loyalty this car inspires is hardwired into our cultural consciousness. One can easily picture a driver behind the wheel of a Jeep, downshifting around a snaking mountain bend, or kicking up dust through the sun-baked Australian outback, or zooming past zebras grazing the Serengeti. Okay, right? These are the romanticized notions of what one could do in a Jeep. And so the Jeep ad is playing well on that idea. Okay. Uh, does this make sense to people in terms of what we're looking for in an ad? And by the way, I'm getting ahead of myself, so I apologize if this confuses anyone, but later in the session we're going to talk about thesis statements. And here's my thesis. 
the thesis is traditionally the final sentence of the introduction. And yes, I'm still getting ahead of myself because you don't have to write an introduction for this week. You're only, I shouldn't say only, you're completing a worksheet. Uh, but because I don't think it hurts to look at examples even this early, what we're working toward, uh, because the worksheet does ask you to create a thesis. Here's my thesis through the use of simple color. So that beige mesh background, playful imagery. So the animal imagery and a double meaning tagline that reinforces theme. Remember, you have to find three things. So for the Jeep ad, yeah, I thought color is important or the background as a whole. It's choice to use animal imagery and that tagline. See whatever you want to see. Uh, I take it a bit further. I mean, yeah, I don't just explain what the tagline is. I think people know what that means. But that, yeah, it can be read two ways, right? See whatever you want to see. It refers to the image itself because you can see whatever you want to see, a giraffe or a penguin. Or in a Jeep, a Jeep allows you to go see whatever you want to see. So you could travel to the Serengeti and see giraffes. Or you could travel to the very southern tip of South, uh, South America to see penguins. Um, and actually, I take it a step farther. I kind of suggest that that tagline is a not so subtle hint at Jeep's versatility, right? That Jeep as a vehicle, we often think of as a versatile automobile. Yeah, it can be used for off-roading, but can also be used for hauling stuff, picking up the kids, right? It's kind of that all-purpose vehicle. And I think the tagline is hinting at that. So that's kind of what I, what I mean by identifying color, imagery, and tagline. Okay, so you'll have to identify three things in your chosen ad. Is this making sense to people? Yes, no, maybe so. Yes, okay, good. Then let's try it with another ad. Oops. One, one. I should note that this is actually an old ad. This comes from the early 1970s. However, it could be an ad from today because there are ads out there that like to appear retro. I don't know if any of you remember an ad that was, it seemed to be always on the air about a year ago. It was for Jose Cuervo and it took place on a plane that was supposedly the plane that was carrying the Rolling Stones, the rock band on tour during the 1970s. And it, yeah, it recreates that seventies vibe. So, okay, this ad isn't from today. It's from the early 1970s, but it could be an ad that exists today. that exists today. Excuse me. What are things that stand out? Again, think about formal qualities, technical stuff, or thematic things. Okay, Emily says the color and the aging. Yeah, the aging in this case comes from the literal fact that it's, just, it's an older ad, but you're right. If this were a contemporary ad that's trying to look retro, then certainly it's making it look, because you can do all sorts of tricks in Photoshop to make it seem older than it really is. Okay, uh, Emily says, her posture and the tagline. Okay, those are both important things, believe it or not. I would say, okay, what is it about the woman's posture or the woman as a whole? Jonathan says, the tagline induces rebellion and makes you feel if it's so wrong, it's right. Okay, good. I think that nails the tagline. Do we understand that your mother wouldn't like it? Right? What wouldn't your mother like? She wouldn't like the, the car or the woman, probably, <laughs> right? And I actually think Jonathan pretty much nailed it. I couldn't word it any better. Um, it's obviously targeting men, and it's kind of it's, it's appealing to men with a suggestion that this is a little bit naughty. This is a little bit dangerous. Um, and gosh, there's so many great things being said in the chat. I'm trying to keep up with all of them. Misty said, no bra. Okay, but listen, we're adults. Why is that important? Like, the woman is important to this ad. Like, you could write an entire paragraph about the woman's role in this ad. What's, what's important about the woman? Like, if we just shout out either adjectives or explanations, what does the woman represent? Or why this woman? In other words, why isn't there a woman who isn't dressed more conservatively, who isn't braless? Uh, 
she's as beautiful as a car. Someone said sex. Yes, that's that's definitely part of it. She's there for fun, and that's it. Jonathan said something about her arm not being in her sleeve shows she doesn't follow conformity or the rules. Okay, good. I never thought of that, but yeah. It's, it's more about what she represents, okay? And by the way, maybe some familiarity with the times would help. We're, we're talking about the early 70s. So we're, we're talking about the height of, I mean, feminism has been around for more than just the 1960s or 1970s, but the late 60s, early 70s definitely is, we're at a stage where bra burning, where women are rebelling against just, you know, wearing poodle skirts and uh, dressing conservatively, right? So this is, yeah, it's, it's, it's a woman who's independent. I don't want to say dangerous, even though that is the connotation too. Uh, but obviously there's nothing really dangerous or wrong or bad about the woman. But yeah, the whole idea here is your mother wouldn't like it. Your mother wouldn't approve of such an independent woman, right? A woman who dresses like this, a woman who confidently, I think this is where posture comes into play, right? And so, yes, a direct comparison is being made. The woman is independent, not following the rules, just as a person who would drive such a car is also not following the rules, right? There's something a little bit different or, again, I hate the word dangerous because I don't want to make that sound like a value judgment. There's nothing wrong with the woman, <laughs> but you know what I'm trying to say, right? Yes, it's like Misty said, independence. <clears throat> Okay. Now, someone mentioned at the very beginning, what about color? Because I do think color is important here. We've definitely, listen, you could definitely write about the woman. The woman is a rich enough topic for an entire paragraph of its own. Like that could be one of your thesis points. That the, that the ad uses an image of an independent woman, right? That's one of the strategies it uses. Okay, good, Timothy and Jonathan. I'm getting, I'm not trying to create divisions here. Everybody's doing an awesome job. I do get a sense, Jonathan, not to put pressure on you, but maybe you're going to be ready to jump in with your ad analysis. Cause yeah, I like, I like everybody's description, but, uh, Jonathan says the red lighting passion and drive, right? Christina says the colors simulate hunger. So they might get people to hunger for the car. Okay. Uh, and here's where research will play a role because, it would be nice to find a quotation where these colors indicate that, right? So you could have backup for what you say. I would say there's also something slightly lurid, if you know that word about the scene. There's something about this lighting that's a little bit sensual, but lurid's a better word. Lurid is like sensual, but with a little bit of seediness mixed in. And again, that's not a value judgment on the woman. It's a difficult thing to explain because the ad is playing with ideas, right? Notions or even stereotypes. So there's nothing wrong with the woman, but the ad is forming a connection. Um, by the way, can anybody, and you'd have to be a really big film buff to figure this out, but you could see it's in front of a movie theater. And I know what movies being advertised here. You could see the name Marlon Brando. Anybody know which movie this is? The title is cut off, but I can already tell what movie it is. Jill says there's a guy in the background looking at her. Yeah, that's not a, I mean, the, the, I don't I don't know if that's enough for an entire paragraph on its own, but maybe while discussing the woman, yes, she's the object of attention. She is front and center. By the way, there's another issue, layout. Okay? So when I say that there are literally six or seven things you can see going on in an ad that are interesting, yeah, the image of the woman. Layout choices. Okay? The woman is front and center. So is the car. But there are other things, like the man looking at her in the distance, or maybe he's looking at the car. Again, both are paired together. Emily says, Last Tango in Paris. Okay, great. If you're not familiar with that film, go Wikipedia. It. It's a great film, but it is, it's an X-rated film. Even by today's standards, it wouldn't get an R rating. It would probably get NC-17 because X doesn't exist anymore because it's almost, not almost, it's entirely associated with pornography. It is a very intense film. And it's a very sexually frank film. And it came out during a period of time, again, early 1970s, where you have films, American films even, that are taking chances, that are 
finally freed from the constraints of old Hollywood, right? Where there used to be censorship. And yes, it is an intense film. Even by today's standards, it is incredibly sexually frank. So even the fact that this is the movie she's standing in front of, that's not an accidental detail, right? This woman, independent, the kind of woman that your mother wouldn't approve of, standing in front of a theater, showing a film that your mother would not approve of, okay? This is why I say that these sorts of details are not accidents. So when you choose your ad out of that list of eight ads, you also have to notice things that are not accident. Okay? And if you can notice three things, great. And by the way, when you complete the worksheets, I'm not going to leave people hanging. If I see that people are having struggle identifying things, yeah, I'll give you a list of six or seven things, and then you can choose three of them. But I do want to see you hopefully find those three things on your own at first. Okay, or maybe you'll have two that are great, but are struggling to find a third, and then I can give you ideas. Um, but I think we've hit on a lot of important things here. Okay, color lighting, overall setting. Okay, we don't know if this is dusk or early morning, but it's in that in-between period. Again, where who's out at this kind of time? What kind of person would be out at that time? Again, this idea of things that are questionable or independent or dangerous, right? So. Yeah, color, reds and yellows, not only the car, but the entire setting, how that's kind of sensuous, but also, like I said, somewhat lurid. Uh, the entire setting with the guy staring and this specific film. So, yeah, there are lots of things we could talk about. Let's take a look at one more ad. I have to speed up because I try to keep these things to an hour, and this one's going a little bit over, but that's okay. Uh, yeah, it's for a British car. But I think that ad works well, whether it's for a European market or an American market. Uh, here, let me go ahead and uh, share this link in the chat. I'll also show it, but I don't. my audio might not come through on your end. So you can either watch on your own real quickly or watch along with me. Here, let me put this in here. And I'll turn up the sound. Okay, I'm going to play it one more time. And I have the sound turned up because sometimes it can come through a little bit, although my colleagues are probably going to yell at me <laughs> for having it too loud. But let's watch it one more time. It's short. It's a short commercial. But again, what are things that stand out to you, either from a technical standpoint or a thematic um uh, viewpoint. Okay, here we go. Okay. Let's see. Emily's already mentioned a good one. The music. Why is music important? What kind of, how would we describe that music? Very 70s. Okay, good. But what does that mean? Let's even be more specific. Jonathan says it's marketing towards women in a somewhat sexual manner. Yes. Emily says 70s porn, LOL. Yeah, that's coming close to it, right? It's funky. <laughs> it's kind of, it's that sort of cheesy music. Yeah, yeah, we can associate with erotic movies or even just, you see it in comedies all the time, right? If it's going to parody like a sex scene, yeah, that kind of over the top, <laughs> funky kind of cheesy music kicks in. Um, and yeah, as Jonathan said, it's, it's, it's marketed towards women in a, a sexual manner, but clearly humorous too, right? It's, it's jokey. Okay. So that comes through in the music, but how else does it communicate? It's kind of, if we, if we agree that it's a humorous take on sexual imagery, it's more than just the music. What else? Terry says tall, uh, tall slim glasses if this makes you slim uh back then women were paired with slim products such as cigarettes as well okay yes that's that's a good point that's that's terrific uh emily says the tagline yes good tall dark and handsome right because normally we associate and listen uh who was it uh terry i mean terry's point is spot on but this is the confusing thing. Ads, they can do two things at once. So absolutely, the, the slimness, because it's being aimed at women, because yes, literally there were ads like Virginia Slims, because uh, cigarettes, 
women used to smoke because nicotine can act as a hunger suppressant. So yes, cigarettes were actively marketed towards women, especially slims, you know, 100s. Uh, and it's right there in the title, Virginia Slims. So definitely the ad is doing that. But and yet tall, dark and handsome is not a description we usually use to describe women, right? It's supposedly the cliched ideal of a man, right? He's tall, dark and handsome. In this case, though, it's not a man. It's a glass. Okay. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it invalidates Terry's earlier, earlier comments. Actually, I've never heard that comment made before, but I think she's right. And an image can be doing two things at once. Um, okay, so the glass, but there's another inter interesting, well, there are lots of interesting things. Okay, so music is important. That tagline is important. Uh, the, the glass, but it's not just the glass, but how is it filmed? I'm kind of leading towards the answer, so that's really bad on my part. <laughs> Slowly, right? It scans. Is it going up the glass or down the glass? I can't remember. But anyway, isn't that what we usually associate again with movies and television with human bodies? Most often female bodies, right? Men sometimes can be filmed that way, but not usually. Either for joking reasons or because there's a filmmaker who's trying to reverse the trend. But typically, how many times have we seen in the film where it's slowly we see a heel? And it's clearly a woman's heel because maybe it's high heel shoes. And then it travels up the leg and then the rest of her body. It's almost like a striptease, except it's not the removal of clothing. It's the slow reveal of the person's body inch by inch, which is kind of striptease-like. And yeah, there's been a lot of criticism about how uh, that, yeah, women are, are kind of the object or the gaze in a lot of these either ads or television shows or movies. And the ad, of course, here is humorously playing on that idea because it's slowly tracking up the tall glass of Diet Coke, right? It's not a human body, and it's not specifically gendered either. Um, so does that make sense? Like camera work is interesting. Music is interesting. Tagline is interesting. So all three of those could be your three thesis points. And if we look at this person's worksheet, I think she identifies those three things. Yeah, here, the tall, tall, uh, excuse me, the Diet Coke, tall, dark, and handsome ad, uses music, cinematography, so I think she's mostly talked about the camera work there, and sexually charged language, so that tall, dark, and handsome, to convince women to buy into the idea that dry, uh, excuse me, drinking Diet Coke is as, as fulfilling as a heteronormative romance. In other words, a, a, a traditional romance between a man and a woman. Okay, so it's playing with all those themes. Um... Okay, great. By the way, this has gone much better. I mean, usually it goes pretty well, but you, either you're all exceptionally bright, uh, but here's the thing. Now do the same thing with your chosen ad. Okay, you've already shown to me with the Jeep ad, the Diet Coke ad, uh, and the car ad that you can spot things pretty quickly. So do the same thing with your chosen ad from the approved list. Or again, find the ad where you can see those things. So if you look at the Allstate ad and are thinking, wow, I can't really see these things as clearly as the examples we used during the lecture, then find the ad where you do. Okay, Don't paint yourself in the corner by choosing an ad that you think is cool and nifty, but ultimately don't have much to say about it. Uh, again, you don't have to love the ad. You just have to be able to see things uh, easily and clearly. And then once you do, yes, you're going to fill out this worksheet. Okay, So there are some basic things like what is the title of the ad? What's the company? Those are very, very easy. Uh, be careful here. Number three says describe the ad as if you were explaining it to someone who has never seen it before. That's clear enough, but sometimes students don't read the next part. Be sure to identify specific details that stand out, such as the ones we've been pointing out in this lecture. Because then number four, you're asked to interpret those details. Okay. So three and four, be sure you read them carefully and completely. And then there's some more basic questions. What is the ad selling? Uh, what need, idea, lifestyle, or attitude is the ad selling? Okay. Who do you think the ad is targeting? Uh, this one needs some explanation. This always confuses students. When it says list three possible rhetorical strategies, it's asking for those three details that you've noticed. Okay. So if you've noticed the ad's use of music, it's used of camera work and something else, this is where you list them. 
the idea is then you're going to take those three things that you see and put them in your thesis. Because that's what a thesis is, by the way. And that's going to be the last thing I cover here. And I'm going to do so super quickly because I think we've kind of already discussed this stuff. So let me skip a few slides. A thesis is like your roadmap to the paper. Okay, it's traditionally the final sentence in what will be your introduction paragraph. And we'll talk about more that more next week when we get into the writing of the essay. For now, though, you need a thesis because that thesis is going to set up the instructor for your entire paper. And here are two thesis examples. and We've already seen these. So here's the Jeep. Through the use of simple color, playful imagery, and a double meaning tagline that reinforces theme, the see whatever you want to see ad appeals to the inner adventurer inside everyone to unlock a hidden enthusiasm for Jeep. And real quickly, and we'll look at this in future weeks, so I won't spend too much time with it, but there's my thesis, right? What, what we just read. When you have your three points, in my case, uh, the ad's color, imagery, and tagline, that sets up the rest of the paper because here's one paragraph all about the ad's use of color or its use of color and background where I talk about the very things you guys mentioned, right? Uh, not only the beige color, but that kind of fabric-y textile quality that the background has and why, right? The color choice is no accident for it reinforces Jeep's outdoorsy image. This color scheme works to promote the rugged off-roading image that the campaign's creators clearly desire. Then I go on to my next point, the Jeep's use of imagery. And I write a paragraph about that. Then the Adds tagline, write a paragraph about that. Then there just needs to be a conclusion, and boom, you've got yourself an essay. So really, if you can set up your thesis by listing your three points, yeah, you've got the entire paper kind of set up for you. Next week, we're going to talk a little bit more about essay structure and also research, because you can see I include research. Uh, and then here's the thesis for Diet Coke, which we also just looked at. Okay, and she identifies her three things too. The language, tall, dark, and handsome, the music, and that slow camera movement. Okay, and her essay, which you also have access to in week three, <coughs> you'll get to see the fully realized ad analysis essay for the Diet Coke ad. And yeah, just a final reminder, the stronger word you can do on the worksheets, the more feedback I can give you. Uh, but otherwise, I look forward to seeing your worksheets. So how about we open up things to q and I apologize. I really do try to keep these things to an hour because my experience shows that if we go too much past an hour, I start to lose people. <laughs> uh, but questions either about ad analysis or the class as a whole. I did forget to mention one thing. There is a five-point penalty per day for late work, so be careful. If you have to hand in things a day late, that's not much of a penalty. But if you hand in something a week late, that's 35 points. So uh, be careful. That said, if life is throwing things at you, either very serious things like illness or, God forbid, a death in the family, certainly I can be flexible. But I tend to be flexible overall. So if you've been called into work double shifts over the weekend and you need an extra day, just let me know. Okay, I'm, I'm very good at that. I'm less flexible when I get a paper out of the blue a week late and then, <clears throat> excuse me, then hear an excuse. Okay, I have to take a drink. You're welcome, Skylar. Uh, some people have to get back to things, I understand. Emily says, everything due on Sundays. Let me take a quick drink because my throat is running dry after speaking for an hour. Yes, and at the beginning of the session, I apologized because there are some dates the department set up all the dates on the McGraw-Hill side of things, and I can't change them. And so I know there's some confusion because the dates on McGraw-Hill show that you have to get things done by Friday. But as I said at the beginning of the session, trust the dates on FSO. Okay? So when it says March 4th, that's the due date. And McGraw-Hill, it, it lets you work on things past the date it's set for. It's not like past March 2nd that you won't be able to go back into the activity. So I apologize for the confusion, okay? Because I know the dates should match, but uh, just trust the dates on FSO and you can always go into McGraw-Hill and complete any activities. Even if there, let's say that something does happen, an emergency, and you do have to hand in work late because you've told me about it and I've said, that's fine. You know, you can have an extra two days. Yeah, you're not locked out of McGraw-Hill. 
you can you can go in even when the class is over i believe you can go in and work on stuff uh so yeah trust dates on the fso side of things that's why i have everything set for sunday because and i think students have responded positively because the way the department has set up the journal response is supposed to be due i think on friday there are other activities that i just think it's simpler to have everything on sunday the one exception and i'll remind people this come week four peer review is a little bit different it ends on a Friday simply because it makes no sense on the final day of class to get feedback from your peers with no time to use it. So this activity does end a little bit earlier. But everything else for the class ends on Sundays. Misty says, last class, everything was due on Friday. I think it's fine if maybe there's a single date, whether it's Friday, whether it's Sunday. But yeah, the multiple dates, I think it's easier for people to remember if they just get it in their mind Sunday. Okay, any other questions about the class as a whole or anything for the first assignment or anything regarding ad analysis? Um, again, and I, I want to thank everybody too because the people who watch this session are going to learn a lot too because they're going to see all the great responses you guys gave in the chat and hopefully they'll be as enthused to attack this ad analysis assignment without fear because I think that's the biggest fear. It's like, oh gosh, what can I say about an ad? But because you guys did such a great job, I think people will feel comfortable in terms of, yeah, okay, I have to choose an ad and be able to spot three things just like they did in the lecture. So thanks, everyone. I'm going to hang out for a little bit if people do have questions. At a certain point, I will stop the recording. Yeah, if you need to go, you're free to go, okay? You don't have to stick around. I thank you for attending. If you, everything was perfectly lucid and clear, yeah, you don't have to stick around. You're free to go. I'll just hang out a little bit and answer questions if people have them. Uh, Timothy, okay, cool. Thank you. Warren says, if I can see, if I see more, can I add more? Uh, regarding the ad in the worksheets? Sure, you can put as many ideas in the worksheet as you want. Um, actually, the more you give me, the more I can respond to. I mean, some people have left, so I, I feel bad about saying this now. But I mean, yeah, I grade the I grade the worksheets based on how well they're matching the material from the lecture. So it's not that you have to have everything 100% perfect, but like sometimes I'll see thesis statements that are quite there, but the potential is there because somewhere in the worksheet, the student actually is focused on a lot of important details and it's my job to say oh you've listed all these things and yeah that these could actually be your thesis points for example in the mcdonald's ad there's some students notice that there's a, a seemingly meaningless moment where uh it's, it's about this guy in his first day at work and he's overwhelmed and his boss is leading him through uh, a tour of the the office but in like a whirlwind whirlwind fashion and he's overwhelmed and at a certain point during the ad he crosses paths with a young woman who's clearly on her first day as well and she's being dragged around on an office tour and it seems trivial right but it's not and students kind of notice that but they don't notice that it's actually yeah a detail worth exploring because that's no accident the ad doesn't have that moment just for no reason because later when the young man escapes from the office goes to McDonald's, feels relieved. Who's there sitting at a table across the way? The same young woman he crossed paths with. Yeah, that's not accident. Uh, that's that's a meaningful detail. So when I see details like that, uh, at least brought up somewhere in the worksheet, that's a good sign. Because at least I can say, hey, you've got all your thesis points here. You just need to see them as such. Uh, Emily says, do you have any tips for thesis or is that something I should wait for next week? Um, I mean, I think maybe I just gave a big one now in terms of uh, writing down as many ideas as you can in the worksheet so that I can spot them. Because, yeah, sometimes the ideas are there. Uh, in terms of thesis, I would just look at those examples, okay? And the worksheet has examples, too. Um, yeah, I think, Emily, I think the thesis will take care of itself if you can see those three things. That's what interests me most. 
I mean, yeah, if we have to talk about the wording of it or improving the wording of it, that I think is an easier fix. To me, what's most important is do you have three solid ideas? Have you noticed three important, interesting details in the ad, just as we've done with the Jeep ad, the car ad, and the uh, Diet Coke ad? Okay. And if you can do that, you should be in fine shape. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. I'll hang out for a little bit more, but for people watching, I'm going to stop.